coming right there. <laughs> Hey, friends and neighbors of uh, Tactical Rifleman, this is Sulu coming at you uh, for in replacement of Carl, and we're going to talk about surviving SEER school. But first, a word from our sponsor. All right, hey guys, this week's video is sponsored by Shooting Targets USA. My favorite targets is the dual entry, of course, but I also like the harmonic human targets. Got tuning forks built in the back of it kind of cool and then the texas star texas stars are awesome you've seen the videos you know all these targets are awesome i hit them up for a promo code use promo code tactical rifleman all one word it's going to save you 25 percent off of all this stuff that's totally badass you check them all out at shootingtargetsusa.com all right guys we're going to talk about surviving sear school so Sierra school isn't something you can actually get ready for. You can't, you're not going to plan to be a prisoner of war. But if, should you become a prisoner of war, you got to understand as a prisoner of war, you also have to protect not only your country, and you're going to have responsibilities to a chain of command, but you have to survive being a prisoner of war and come home with some kind of integrity. Because no matter how tough you are or how mean you think you can be back to the enemy, you're going to get broken down and you're going to sign the papers. You're definitely going to sign the papers, but you're going to come back with some dignity. Now, SEER stands for survival, evasion, resistance, and escape. The SEER school that I went to, and there's there are several SEER schools, but SEER, uh, SEER school is basically set up for people who might possibly get captured behind enemy lines and become a prisoner of war. So it's a very important and very, very useful training. Unfortunately for me, my training was going all the way back to 1990. So we're talking 30 years ago. And the SEER that I went to was basically based off of the survival, evasion, resistance, and escape that was a course in the Special Warfare Center created by Nick Rowe. Nick Rowe Colonel Nick Rowe, who was actually killed in the Philippines in 1989, just a year before I went to his school that he created in 1987, Nick Rowe was a prisoner of war from 1963 to 1968 in the Republic of Vietnam. Nick Rowe was uh, captured as a lieutenant along with uh, uh, Sergeant Major, or actually at the time, uh, Sergeant First Class Dan Pitzner and a, a guy named uh, Rock Versace, or Captain Rock Versace, right? And uh, they were actually spent five years in bamboo cages, uh, or Nick Rowe did, and they spent five years in bamboo cages in, uh, in the jungles of Vietnam. And after that, after he escaped, <coughs> and he escaped in, in a very unique way, he actually waved down a helicopter, and the door gunner, instead of, of taking him out, Notice that this guy in black pajamas had a beard. So the pilot landed and the door gunner was going to have a prisoner and he grabbed and he was going to get out and grab Nick Rowe. Nick Rowe jumped into the helicopter and they took off and that's how uh, Nick Rowe escaped from his five years of captivity in October of 1968. Years later, him and Dan Pitchner got together and uh, they went to Special Warfare Training Center and they created the, the SEER school that I went to and that was still part of the pipeline today in 2023. Back in 1990, it was not part of the, of the course. It was considered advanced training, all right? And it's kind of funny how that all came about for me. I actually went through SEER school as a student in the Q course. I started out as a... As a uh, uh, 18 Echo, I was in the Commo course, I was doing Morse code, and I thought, well, I don't want to be a Commo guy, here's a way to get out of it. I purposely failed the uh, advanced Morse code, or the uh, AMIC as they called it. The advanced international Morse code, AMIC, was something we had to pass 15, uh, 15, 15, 15 groups per minute, 15 send, 15 receive, and I failed. I failed on purpose, there's about a dozen of us who failed. Mark Barr, which Carl and I was on our team, was one of the ones who failed with me. And I thought, well, now I can go down and be a Bravo or a weapons guy, or I can be an engineer. He went and uh, the operations sergeant 
he basically called my unit, 12th Group Reserves, and said, hey, can we send LaRue down to uh, be, a, be a weapons sergeant or an engineer? And my operations sergeant was like, wait a minute, this guy, he actually passed Morse code back in 1981, and he sent my graduation certificate. So the operations sergeant came out and he said, all you guys are going to go in the slave market. You're going to be guards out at SEER school. And except for you, LaRue, you're going to be a student. And I, I was like, oh, man, that's, that's not fair. We called it Camp Slappy back then. We knew what SEER school was, and it was considered advanced training. It wasn't part of the pipeline. We didn't have to go through it to, be, get, to get our Green Berets. But uh, as we were doing a uh, parachute detail that night, I was passing my parachute off to a SWIC instructor, and all my buddies were telling me about how SEER school was going to be rough on me. And they told me about this guy called the Bearded One, big, huge WWF wrestler who basically slapped people around in the resistance part of it. The, the camp. And uh, I told the guys, I'm not scared of anybody. I will kiss that man on the cheek and he always owe me something. They said, you do that, we'll put a case of beer. When you get back to the barracks, there'll be a case of beer waiting for you with a hundred dollar bill on it. I said, fair enough, I'll do that. All right. So I went out there and, uh, by the, and we'll get to that later, but it didn't work out too well for me. It did not work out too well for me. I uh, got on the truck the next Monday and I went out to Camp McCall, and out there at Camp McCall, uh, uh, Dan Pitsner was still one of the instructors, and they had officially created this school in 1987, and I uh, was uh, honored and privileged enough to meet some legendary instructors, a Richmond Nail, a former Sergeant Major, uh, incredible guy, we call him the one-eyed the one fat man. Uh, he, was, he was in his 60s, and he had one eye. and. Uh, he, he's the one that uh, basically saw my combat, my combat patch on my right side when I was in Grenada Raider. He's like, LaRue, uh, you, look, you look a little young. Uh, when, when did you serve in Vietnam with the 82nd? And I was like, Vietnam? Come on, Sergeant Major. I was, I was, I was in Grenada. You know, I, was, I served in Grenada. He goes, how many times did you get shot at in Grenada? And I said, I got, I got shot at four times, Sergeant Major. Richmond Nail pulled out his glass eye and he spit on it. And he's like, uh, hell, LaRue, I've been hit more times than you've been shot at. And he put his glass eye back in. And what do you say to something like that? The other guy was uh, Gary O'Neill. Gary O'Neill uh, was a fantastic instructor, and he's the one that taught us how to uh, basically control our pain and, and how we felt uh, uh, when we were being hurt. Uh, if you want to know about Gary O'Neill, read The American Warrior, this book right here. That's Gary O'Neill, and he was a he was a SEER instructor out there, and uh, it, it just 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 a fantastic fantastic uh, course. Uh, we talk about surviving it. I don't know what it's like today, and I'll get into why I don't know what it's like because re remember I said this was based off of uh, off of the actual experiences of Nick Rowe and Dan Pissner and, uh, and their, their uh, captivity during the Vietnam struggle, all right? But that first week that we were there, we did learn about the history of, and, and of POWs all the way back to the Civil War. We're talking, uh, we're talking the, the prisons and, uh, of the Civil War where guys are basically starved to death, the Revolutionary War where guys are put on prison barges and they were just lots of disease, lots of lots of starving, uh, prisoners weren't very well taken care of at all, uh, but we learned the laws of land warfare. And most of the, the signers of this, mostly European countries, uh, they got together after World War I and they said, uh, this, is, this is how we need to treat prisoners. You know, we, they, we, we need uh, an actual uh, code, if you will, of how prisoners will be, will be uh, treated. So uh, we learned a lot about that uh, in some of the classes during that first week at Sear, at Sear School. We, we learned about the effects of prisoner and, and overall military strategy. You know, that's a, that's a huge, that's a huge uh, leveraging point that, uh, that not only politicians, but uh, generals have when you have, when you have prisoners, okay? Uh, there's, there's a lot of political leverage behind all that, all right? And uh, it got into, uh, got into some really, Really fascinating points, especially during Vietnam, and we'll talk about how that affected Vietnam after a word from uh, from YouTube channel and some of the the uh, advertisements. Be right back. 
All right, hope you enjoyed that. And uh, we we're going to get back into the history of, of, the prisoners of uh, the prisoners of war and the responsibilities of being a prisoner of war. Remember when you're a prisoner of war, you're still part of the military, whether you're Air Force, Navy, uh, Army, or Marine Corps, all right? And uh, there was a place in Vietnam, in northern Vietnam, called the Hanoi Hilton in Hanoi. And we learned incredible amounts of stories of some, some really uh, great acts of courage that these, these prisoners endured while they're at Hanoi Hilton. And they weren't allowed to communicate. Uh, with, they, with just, uh, they, were, they, were treated, they were treated pretty roughly. And uh, uh, when, the, uh, when it became close to the pullout of Vietnam, or, or close to 1973, uh, between 1971 and 1973, there were a bunch of negotiations going on with the Paris Accords. And uh, they got to talking about, OK, how many prisoners do you actually have? And the North Vietnamese would not, would not actually put it, the information out. There was one guy named McDonald or that, that was in the Navy. He'd actually fallen off of a battleship. And he was one of the prisoners there, and the North Vietnamese thought he was retarded because the guy just went in there and he acted stupid the whole time he was there at the Hanoi Hilton. And uh, the colonel, the, the guy in charge, was, was a, an officer named Stockdale. And he got this guy to keep on acting retarded and acting w with a lot of buffoonery. But he had him actually memorize every single name that was in the Hanoi Hilton to the tune of Old MacDonald Had a Farm. And when the, the North Vietnamese, in a gesture of goodwill, released this man, he was able to go back to the United States and actually tell exactly how many prisoners were there and by name and with a by name list. So when they came back to the Paris Accords, the Americans at the, at the State Department level said, OK, we know exactly who's in this, this, uh, this prison camp at Hanoi Hilton, and uh, we, we know who they are and how many you have. And that, that really shocked the North Vietnamese, right? Uh, it's a part of, it was part of a disinformation campaign, too. Uh, everybody probably heard about Jane Fonda and her act of treason uh, during this time. She was a young woman, and she was, she was an activist. And she thought she was doing a great thing, you know. And she was kind of rebellious against her father, Henry Fonda, who was an actor. And uh, she w actually went to North Vietnam. And she sat on a anti-aircraft gun and got filmed and everything like that. And then, <clears throat> the uh, uh, when she was there, one of the one of the uh, officers that she shook hands with, one of the American officers, slipped her a note. You know, basically said, "We're being tortured here." And uh, Jane Fonda actually turned around and handed that to the commandant of Hanoi Hilton. <coughs> Excuse me. That's that's that in itself is an act of treason, but. What she did later was actually absolutely horrible to and uh, very uh, influential to Nick Rowe. Nick Rowe was a Green Beret, right? Nick Rowe's cover story was and uh, had been telling his interrogators in this camp in the jungle that these guys were, were basically <coughs> advisors. Green Berets were advisors and they were just helping to make better living conditions for the Vietnamese. Jane Fonda told him that Green Berets were actually military advisors and they trained the Vietnamese on how to resist the South Viet or the North Vietnamese Army and the Viet Cong. So that put Nick Rowe on an execution list. Nick Rowe was being walked to his execution and he, that's when he escaped. He actually killed his handler or his guards to actually get out into the open and get onto that helicopter. All right? So there's 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 a lot of rules in that too, and we I was shocked as a student in Sierra School to realize that there's there's laws of land warfare and there's things that you're allowed to do and that you're not allowed to do as a prisoner of war, right? Some of the other things we learned there in uh, in this first week was the uh, uh, the Miss X files from Fort Devens or Fort Hunt. Uh, they were, during World War II they were actually in care packages from the Red Cross. They were sending in decks of cards. If you took and ripped these decks of cards apart, you made a map of Germany, things like that. Uh, the, didn't work too much in the Japanese side on the Pacific Theater because the Japanese were very brutal and they didn't, they didn't allow too many uh, Red Cross messages or packages, care packages coming to the prisoner of war. 
And you probably heard about the, the Baton Death March, which is still practiced today, actually reenacted on Fort Bliss, because where many of those, those soldiers were from, who were got captured at the Battle of Baton, and uh, they were worked to death, which is, for, according to the laws of land warfare, prisoners are not supposed to work on, on battlefield emplacements, bridges, and things like that to help the enemy, but the Japanese forced them to do that. Next, we went into survive phase of the SEER acronym, and that's plants for food and medicinal purposes. Uh, we did kill classes on mammals, goats and chickens and, and, and rabbits, learned how to butcher and, and uh, cure meat or keep meat longer, a little bit longer, you know, smoking it and everything. Uh, we did exp uh, expedient fishing and trapping, uh, and that was all before we went on to our evasion mode. Once we got into our evasion mode, we had to go out and we basically had to run from, from guys from the, uh, the 82nd. There were, there were guys who were detailed to chase us. And we ran all over, not on Fort Bragg or not on Camp McCall, but in uh, some, of the, uh, some of the training areas that are agreed upon were through a memorandum of agreement. It was mostly farmer's fields and, and national forest, right? So uh, during invasion, we put to test what we learned about camouflage, hide site selection, counter tracking and tracking fundamentals, where I really got into, uh, I, I really love that part of it, and I became uh, kind of attuned to that, especially after I got out of out of SEER school. We did that for a f six days, and we got kind of hungry. I did it in October, so we weren't that hungry. I mean, there was plenty of stuff where we could rob from gardens or or feeder corn, and 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 uh, you know, where the guys had set up for uh, corn corn patches for deer and stuff like that. We ate a lot of that kind of stuff. Roadkill. We actually picked up dead dead animals from off the road. And in our little group that we were running in, we actually ate off of that for three, four, five, five days until we were actually captured or what we thought we were made it to our end point. We were then told we were captured and we went to an actual prison camp on Camp McCall. That's where we went into the resistance mode. And we'll talk about this, uh, my, my first meeting with the bearded one after word from, again, YouTube. I don't know uh, if, they, if YouTube's gonna like this, but uh, m most of this has been declassified, is that the resistance camp, or what we call Camp Slappy on Camp McCall. Being, uh, uh, being back in 1990, they had the one, called, the, the, the one main interrogator called the bearded one. I hadn't met him yet or anything, and bet between uh, all this, uh, this interrogation and some of the, uh, some of the uh, acts of, acts of uh, no, I shouldn't say violence, the, the acts of uh, uh, torture or, or some, of the, some of the stuff that, they're, they, they, that you could expect to be seeing, all the instructors there would speak with a, a heavy accent, whether it be Spanish or Russian or German, and uh, I was, went into my first soft cell. There's a soft cell and a hard cell. Soft cell is where you get interrogated. We all had a cover story. I, my cover story is I was a mechanic, a 63 Bravo. I had just been rolled up with these guys that I got captured with, and I didn't know anything of what was going on, right? And the hard cell is where you get slapped around, tortured, uh, put in cold water, uh, put into a cell. I'm six foot four. You get put into a cell that's five foot five. It's like a wall locker. You can't actually stand up and you can't sit down either. And you get left in there for hours. Or you get you get uh, put in a, a little cubby hole in a little box that's out in the heat and you sweat a little bit. Uh, and it, you think you're there forever, but actually this, uh, this whole resistance camp, we were only in there for three, well, we had to do an extra day. We were in there for four days. But I went into the soft cell interrogation and my interrogator was, uh, you know, I went, we went back and forth trying to get me to sign some papers and I told him I couldn't sign and my hands hurt and all those kind of things. And, uh, uh, but he rolled me over to do push-ups. I didn't do very well. And uh, it, I just basically gave him my name and my serial number and I was a mechanic. And, uh, he said, uh, you don't, he kind of came out of character a little bit, and he said, uh, you don't remember me, do you? And I said, 
I was like, no, this is the first time I've ever met you. And he goes, no, 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 we met a couple weeks ago. You were handing me parachutes when you told everybody that you would kiss the bearded one. And the bearded one's waiting for you. He's out in the camp. Uh, I almost lost it there. I, I, I went into panic mode. I knew that I was in trouble. And uh, my cover story was blown. And I went back into the wire gate. And there in the big compound was the biggest man I've ever seen in my life. Right? And he, he was actually a pretty, a pretty nice guy in real life, a Baptist preacher and everything. He actually wrestled in the WWE against Andre the Giant, uh, where Andre the Giant was, had a ranch out there in Ellerbury, North Carolina, not far from where this camp was at. So these guys were buddies. I didn't know anything about it. You know, I'm, I'm from out west. I, didn't, I, I thought the WWE was fake, you know, and, uh, but, but this guy was for real. And he was probably almost seven foot tall. And he says, oh, LaRue, I've been waiting for you. And he reached out to grab me. And this part of his hand touched one nipple. And the other part went all the way across my chest. And I had a big chest. I was doing a lot of push-ups back then. And he squoze my nipples together. And I was standing up on my tiptoes. And they, wasn't, they weren't allowed to actually hit you with a closed fist. But I'm looking up at this guy. And he hit me with an open hand. He reached back like this. He couldn't go all the way back like this, but he reached back like that. And when he hit my face, it was like somebody took a spade shovel and hit me across the face with a shovel. And he went to work on me. And I did a dance with the bearded one. And I never did get close enough to kiss him because he just kept me straight arm on my tiptoes for most of the time he worked with me. And that's, Felt like a very, very long time. And uh, that was my introduction to hard cell techniques. And then we got put in a formation and everything. We were all standing there. We had a camp leader and we had uh, what was called the war baby, one of the youngest guys in there and one of the shorter guys. And the war baby, every time we we would resist and talking uh, or, or we wouldn't conf conformed to the rules of the camp, the war baby got beat. So I felt sorry for that guy because uh, I wasn't conforming to nothing. During this time inside this camp, they really get to, really get to beating you up on your culture, diff your cultural differences back in your home country, which was for us the United States, of course. And uh, they said, okay, all the black guys come over here. Well, I'd go over there with the black guys. And they said, hey, hey, LaRue, you're not, you're not black, you're not black. And I was like, oh, I'm half black. You know, so I'd get to sit down or all that. And I was, I was just continually trying to, know, to mess up their, their little scenarios and the way they were working it to where they would break down our cultures or turn, turn us against each other as prisoners. And uh, that's, that, that, that's one of the key points of going through SEER training is staying together as a team, Knowing that there is a chain of command, even though you're a POW, you have to try to not only gather information, but you got to keep together as a cohesive unit, right? No matter where those guys are from and, uh, uh, or ser what service they're from. And I imagine during World War II, it was even worse because you had British, American, French, and other, se uh, several other nationalities inside these prison camps resisting the Nazi attempts to break down the cultural differences and political differences. Uh, we'd had political discussions in there. Uh, and they would, they would basically try to say that, oh, you're just being used. And uh, you know this, this country that you're from is just using you as cannon fodder. And, and it, it, they really did a really good job of, of making you feel horrible about where you're from. And, uh, but we, we did everything we could to, to maintain that. At the same time, we're gathering information. We're looking for weak points in the fence. We're trying not to build uh, fighting positions and things like that. And remember, all my buddies are up in the towers. They're one of the ones on the slave markets that are dressed up as guards now and everything. But my whole face is swollen up, and my nose is on one side of my face and everything. And, and again, they put us in this formation to beat up the war baby. And as the interrogators or the uh, guards walked in front of you, you had, to, you had to bend down and keep your head lower than their head, but you had to look up at them. Well, this little chick comes by me. She's about this tall. Well, I'm, I'm hurting. I can't get down that far. 
So the big black guy grabs me and he pushes me up against the wall. And uh, he says, you didn't get down low enough. He didn't get loud. So all the guards started slapping me and hitting me and on my already bruised face and already closed eye. And I was, I was getting mad as hell. And I was clenching up my fists. One of the, one of the, one of the guards got up close to my ear and he says, unclench your fists, unclench your fists. Well, that black guy jumped in and I can't remember his name, but he hawked a loogie like, like that and he spit a big loogie across my face. Oh my God, that made me mad. And I, even though I was trying to act weak and tired and everything, I, I really, really wanted to fight right then. But we, you know, you had to stay in character and if, this is probably the most realistic training I've, well, some of the most realistic training I've ever been through. And uh, I was about ready to lose my temper to face a firing squad or not. But I unclenched my fists and everything. And that night, we had to go and witness somebody being shot at the firing squad. Well, what we didn't know, in my escape team, one of the guys had actually quit. We didn't know that. He'd actually dropped out of the training. The, 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 uh, uh, graduation rate was pretty low back then in 1990. Again, it's not part of the pipeline. You did not need this course, all right? But we all sat there and we witnessed somebody with a bag over their head actually face a firing squad and get shot. Well, you know, with the lights facing us and looking into it, this guy looked like he really got shot. And I was like, where the hell am I at? This is for real. And we'll continue on with the last day of Sears School after this word from YouTube. All right, now we're back. We're gonna talk about my last day in, in Camp Slappy there in the SEER course at Camp McCall back in 1990, right? And again, everything's based off of, of uh, lessons that the military learned in either World War II, Korea, or Vietnam, all right? Part of, that, part of that training, after we witnessed somebody getting shot, was we would report back to our commander, we're looking for the weak points for the E in the acronym of SEER, which is ESCAPE. Now, if uh, you guys would go back into your history, there's a, there's a movie called The Great Escape. Actually, it, they had broken down the camp into cells some guys made uniforms or civilian clothing. Other guys put uh, evasion maps together. Other, other guys were digging down, digging tunnels, and they, they basically dug three different tunnels to the edge of the camp. And uh, one of the tunnels was actually discovered and shut down, but they continued on. And only a certain amount of the prisoners were allowed to escape, right? So they picked I think 240, if I remember my numbers right, they, they picked 240 guys, 250 guys to escape that night. Only 180 made it out before they were, before they were uh, thwarted and caught inside the tunnel. But the guys who did make it out were either in German uniform or German civilian clothes, had uh, identification papers from another cell that had, had put together the paperwork and identification cards. Uh, Breaching, breaching equipment, uh, air systems made for the tunnels, all, all done by different cells inside of, the, uh, inside of this prison camp. And one cell didn't know what the other one was working on. They didn't even know who was gonna get to escape until just a few days before this planned escape was, uh, was, was actually executed. What was amazing about that, if you look at the political ramifications for Nazi Germany, the German people were in absolute fear that 150 escaped prisoners were running all over their country. And a lot, of the, a lot of the forces that were heading towards the Western Front were actually stopped and pulled back inside of Germany to find these guys. And they found most of them. There's only a few, only a handful actually escaped into Spain or into France. And uh, of all those people that were captured, uh, 55 of them were actually taken off the road and executed, which turned out to be a war crime. And after the war, at the Nuremberg trials, the people that executed them from that Stalag were actually put on trial, and I think a couple of them were hung. I'd have to go back and check on that, but I think a couple of these people were actually hung for actually going against them. Now remember, this is 1990. 1991, uh, we actually went to the Gulf War. Okay, 
I'd already been through SEER training, but I had not got my Green Beret yet. I hadn't actually finished the Green Beret training. So I did not get to go to the Gulf War. Uh, the Gulf War and the 100 hours that the uh, ground forces went against Saddam Hussein's army in Kuwait, I was actually still in the Q course. But there were some British soldiers from the SCS with a call sign of Bravo 20 that I got to work with years later. And Stan and Dinger and a couple of the other guys, I actually got to sit in 1994, I got to sit down in Norway and hear what happened to these guys. And uh, I realized then that surviving SEER school would have really helped them out uh, in, the, in the absolute torture, de-degradation of their, not only their culture, but their individualism inside of that prison uh, that Saddam Hussein was running. And uh, very, very good information. We take those notes of what these guys went through and we'd incorporate that back into our SEER training, which by 1994, I think it was after 94, that it actually became part of the pipeline or actually part of the, uh, went from advanced training back into the basic training. And then all Green Berets actually had to go to the SEER C course. SEER, the C being, you're gonna go to Camp Slappy, you're gonna get interrogated and you're going to go through some rough times. Uh, again, most of the other services do have a SEER course, but there's only a, a few SEER C schools, right? And uh, these guys from Bravo 20, their information, they, they actually traveled around to all the groups, fifth group, 10th group, third group, and they would sit down in auditoriums and they would, they would go over what they went through. Now, years later, 2001, after the towers went down and everything, we went to Afghanistan, and then in, and then uh, Carl and I were part of the invasion of not only Afghanistan but Iraq, and we would we would actually go into there. We went into these countries expecting that if we ever got captured, that we better use our SEER school training. Uh, unfortunately, that's kind of exactly opposite, and that's why I don't know what's going on at SEER school now, because during the global war on terror, uh, if you were captured, you ended up on a, in an orange jumpsuit, and uh, you were on Al Jazeera for just a minute or some other social media done by these, by these uh, uh, Al-Qaeda in, in Iraq or, or Al-Qaeda organizations, and uh, you were beheaded. You were basically got your head cut off. There were no long-term prisoners of war being held by the enemy during the global war on terror. So things might have changed a little bit, but uh, going to, going to Seer, Skier School at Camp McCall back in 1990 was uh, absolute, not only, did, not only did I have to learn to survive Seer School, but I had to understand the importance and responsibilities of being a PM, POW. And uh, my last day, uh, the now, nowadays, I, well, I don't know about nowadays, but shortly thereafter, after my class, you didn't go straight back. You know, we, we got rescued from the prison camp. We went straight back, went to the mess hall, and we were told to go to the NCO club the next day for a big breakfast. Everybody had a breakfast and everything. Your interrogators came in, gave you a hug, went over, you know, points one, two, and three of what you did during your interrogations and everything. They basically told me, hey, don't ever get captured, LaRue. You, you just resist on everything. And, you're, you're trying to do the Rocky Versace thing, which he was captured with Nick Rowe, and he was executed by the Vietnamese army because all he gave us name and serial number. You gotta learn that uh, you gotta actually just take your lumps and keep going, and uh, knowing that uh, you, you gotta come out of, of, of a prisoner of war situation, you gotta come out with some dignity. But I was, I was too, uh, I, I guess I was too resistant, and I, I just, didn't get that part of it, and I fought back hard. So they told me, don't get it, ever get captured. And then they all brought us back together, and everybody did a big class photo and a kumbaya hug and everything, and they said, did anybody got anything else to say? And I looked across the table at that black instructor with the green eyes and everything. I said, I got something to say. And I pushed my chair back, and I jumped up on the table and jumped across at him and put his throat in my hands and I told him if he ever spit in my face again I'd rip his head off and shit down his neck 
And so I didn't survive Sears school very well because the rest of the afternoon I sat in front of a psychologist who looked like an axe murderer and I kept on convincing the psychologist, trying to convince the psychologist that yes, I love my father, no, my stool wasn't black, and that I wasn't crazy, and I wasn't that violent. But uh, it, it was very realistic training, and uh, you, if you go to Sears School, especially the one at Camp McCall, you actually feel like you've been a prisoner and you've been tortured. And with that, I want all of you to remember Take your lumps, smile, things always get better. If you like this video, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Also, make sure you follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter so you don't miss out on anything.